on another episode of Self-Directed. I'm excited to talk to a very special guest today, somebody whose content I followed for a, a long time and who is a, a thought leader in the education space. Somebody uh, I think has tons of great opinions and tons of experience in this matter. Um, Kara McDonald's Senior Education Fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, an adjunct, adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and author of Unschooled, a new book, uh, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside a Conventional Classroom. In addition to her regular column at Forbes.com, where she spots, spotlights innovative K-12 through learning models, Carrie's articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, NPR, Education Next, Reason Magazine, Entrepreneur, the School of Journal, the Journal of School Choice, among others. Uh, her research interests include homeschooling and alternatives to school, self-directed learning, education entrepreneurship, parent empowerment, school choice, in family and child policy. Carrie has a master's degree in education policy from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in economics from Bowdoin College. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband and four children. You can find her at feed.org backslash Carrie. Follow her on Twitter at Carrie underscore edu. Carrie, welcome to Self-Directed. Oh, it's great to be here, Mitchell. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I am excited to, to have you. I feel like, uh, you know, there, there were so many gaps when I was reading your bio and your life story, which is, which is where I love to start these conversations. You know, you've got, you know, you, such an awesome background in the work you've done in education. Where did this all start? Where's your passion for education, and in particular, like edu education policy and alternative education from? When did it all start for you? Yeah, that's a great question. So I went to K-12 to public schools in the suburbs of Boston and never really thought much about different education models or different ways of living and learning. Uh, and I went to college and was an economics major at Bowdoin, but I became increasingly interested in education, took a bunch of education classes there, uh, mainly looking at education from the lens of economics and particularly the limited choices mm -hmm. that a lot of families had with respect to education because of sort of this uh, government monopoly on mass schooling. And, and at the time, this was in the late 1990s, you know, very few education choice mechanisms were in place. Uh, charter schools were kind of just coming on the scene. Uh, and that was really the extent of uh, any kind of school choice movement. So I became more and more interested in, in education and education alternatives uh, at that time. And it was my senior year in college that I was able to do an independent research project uh, in education, and I had a classmate who had a family member that lived nearby who was homeschooling, and I never knew anything about homeschooling. I never knew a homeschooler. Again, this was the late 1990s. Homeschooling had just become legally recognized in all 50 states by the mid-1990s, so it was still a relatively new phenomenon, still somewhat on the margins, definitely not in the mainstream the way it is today. Uh, 1999, for example, was the first year that the U.S. Department of Education began tracking the numbers of homeschoolers, and they counted about 850,000 at that time. Now, of course, we're around 2 million. Um, and so I remember shadowing this homeschooling family for that semester and just being completely captivated by what I saw, you know, just being able to recognize education without schooling, in this case, very much tied to the child's interests and talents and pa passions, uh, authentic socialization in yeah. the real world, That's in huge. the people, <laughs> places and things of the community. Uh, and it was really in stark contrast to that same semester when I was doing a student teaching practicum in a local public elementary school and, you know, saw really how that was characterized much more by conformity and compliance and obedience. And I don't think I ever really appreciated this contrast between kind of conventional schooling and another way to be educated because, of course, I had only known the former. I had only yeah. ever experienced conventional schooling. So that blew my mind and really, uh, I think, prompted my overall interest in thinking out of the box around education and particularly around education innovation and education alternatives. So then I went to graduate school in education policy at Harvard, became increasingly interested in educational freedom um, and different education choice programs and, and always thinking again about education separate from schooling. 
But yeah. it was about a, a decade later, really, when I was a mom looking at education options for my own children that I really revisited homeschooling at that point, seeing how much it had grown, not only in population, but also in diversity, demographically and ideologically um, diverse, you know, over yeah. just that span of time and realized that it would be a really great fit for, for our family. That, that's awesome. And I want to come back to, to you, you know, the, the schooling method and the education method uh, with your own kids. But what, what I'm, what I'm really interested in is, did you have any, do you have any pin, opinions about education and what the most effective methods were prior to that experience where you got to see homeschooling for the first time in, in, in real life? Well, I think like most people, I, you know, believed that the way to be educated was to be schooled. Mm -hmm. And in particular to be schooled in this kind of, factory model of you know compulsory education that yeah. really we've had since um, the mid 19th century and I didn't really question it until I began to see that there were other ways to be educated and then I was really hungry for more information about how we came to have this compulsory mass schooling model and that history which I go through in my unschooled book is really just fascinating um, imported from the Prussian model mm -hmm. of education um, the Prussians implemented compulsory schooling in the early 19th century and then education reformers in, in America were really intrigued by it and decided to bring that same methodology to uh, create a system of compulsory mass schooling in the states, which really for the first time focused on um, age segregated classrooms, a standardized curriculum, standardized teaching, tra teacher training, and compulsion, meaning that parents would be required to send their children to school under a legal threat of force. Prior to 1852, that simply didn't exist in the United States. Uh, and that was a huge sea change from what was really a decentralized approach to education uh, that focused on all kinds of different alternatives, everything from an assortment of private and public schools, including mm -hmm. private schools that would be low cost, charity schools that would be free for students, to apprenticeship programs, which of course was the dominant, a dominant method of education, um, again, prior to compulsory schooling in the, in the mid 19th century and beyond. So uh, that was really fascinating for me is just to see how we got here and then to begin to challenge that model, particularly now I feel like where we're in this innovation economy and uh, this compulsory system of mass schooling, I just don't feel um, really is well suited yeah, <laughs> to the absolutely. realities of the innovation era when we have to really distinguish ourselves as humans from robots right yeah. so we have a system of schooling that trains people to be very robotic to do what they're told to check the boxes to move along the conveyor belt from kindergarten to college without really thinking too much about that pathway and instead we uh you know we need individuals we need free thinkers and people who are imaginative and able to be entrepreneurs and create, you know, new ways of thinking and doing um, that I just don't think is cultivated well in a system that's of education that's really focused on conformity and compliance. Yeah, absolutely. The 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 days of training people for factory worker jobs is just that's that's a it's an era long long past due and and with you know with with automation increasing and and increasingly becoming a more important part of you know, the way business is conducted, like, it just doesn't make sense. I, I think I'm following with you. So, so when you think about education now, you know, you've, you've been studying and thinking about this and writing and even experimenting um, your, yourself for, for a long time now, what do you think is the most important distinction between, you know, education and schooling and what marks, you know, what are the, what's the mark of a successful education in your opinion? Mm, really interesting. Well, I mean, schooling is one method of education, certainly the dominant method, the one that we're mostly familiar with. Um, but really, schooling is much more something that happens to you, right? I think we can grow up, I, and I say this in, in my book, Unschooled, I say, you know, I feel like I went through this process of schooling um, and feel felt like when I, you know, finally realized there were other ways to be educated, I realized that you can be well schooled, that I was well schooled, but not necessarily well educated. 
educated, right? Like I had gone through this process and I had done everything the teacher told me to do. And I, you know, checked all the boxes and regurgitated the information that I needed to on the test uh, and, you know, collected the teacher's accolades and all of those things that you're supposed to do as kind of an obedient, good student, right? But in terms of really having a sense of being educated, that's when I realized that that's a, a completely separate process. That's really developing skills and knowledge and using those skills and knowledge in a way that makes your life uh, more meaningful and able, enables you to um, achieve ultimate human flourishing. And, you know, I don't know that school really does that. It certainly doesn't do it for a lot of people who I think are discouraged from really discovering their, pa their passions or pursuing their interests. Um, you know, often childhood interests in particular in school are crushed because, yeah. you know, it's irrelevant or your interests are not meaningful in the context of whatever curriculum is being uh, put forth at that time. And I think that that's really damaging for a lot of children. I mean, if you think about young children are incredibly curious and creative. And as uh, uh, Peter Gray, who's a Boston College psychology professor and an unschooling advocate who writes the foreword to my unschooled book, he says that that creativity and curiosity don't just disappear when a child turns five or six years old. Yep. We crush that through a system of coercive schooling. Um, and so the idea with unschooling or what I would define as sort of a different way of being educated outside of schooling is simply not to crush that <laughs> those natural drives for creativity and curiosity that young children exude and instead keep that process going, cultivate that creativity and curiosity, uh, encourage originality and independent thinking, um, encourage young people to be inventive and to be entrepreneurial. And I think that that is what ultimately will lead to a much more, uh, a much better educated citizenry and a much more fulfilled citizenry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've seen that, uh, you know, for, firsthand at Praxis and even, you know, I, I have, separately from Praxis, working with people that are, that are coming right out of, out of school, like 18 years of school or even, you know, 20, 22, you know, they're graduating college in many cases and they're, they're fresh on the, uh, you know, fresh into their careers. And it's very difficult to make that leap toward approaching their jobs with, you know, that, that, that uh, curiosity, that natural curiosity, that ability to independently think versus waiting for assignments. And I think that, that it makes a lot of sense when you say that, you know, like, like the public schooling or just schooling in general tends to change the way we approach, you know, thinking in general. Um, yeah, I, I, I just would, I would just add, I think the real key um, element is personal agency. And that yeah. is something that is diminished typically through a system of conventional schooling um, where you're taught really to put your own interests and your own um, passions to the side in pursuit of this um, standard pathway of learning. And then, of course, you become an adult and <laughs> now all of a sudden have to figure it out. What am I passionate about? How yeah. do I take charge of my own, of my own life? What, what, what are my talents and my gifts? So it's this complete shift from how we're trained and conditioned to learn and to be educated as children and adolescents to then adulthood trying to, to reconnect with those natural drives for learning and discovery and, uh, and really tapping into that personal agency. So we feel like we can ultimately steer, steer our own lives the way um, that's meaningful to us. Yeah. And, and the, the, the other thing about education, well, schooling in general, when I, th when I think back just on my own experiences, is it becomes so compartmentalized you know, it's, it's great. You're reading a book and you're very interested in it. Well, that's great. But put that aside, it's time for math. And, and you, you become, um, you become, you almost become this, this product of, of habit where, you know, the bell rings and it's time for the next class. And you, you lose that, that serendipitous learning that happens when you just get lost in something you're interested in. I think that's right. And I, I'm actually quite hopeful because I do think that adults today um, because of the impact of technology, recognize that there are so many ways to learn and be educated 
um, that would have been impossible really a decade or two Mm -hmm. ago. I mean, if you think about how we learn now as adults, if we're curious about something, we can typically access information about that topic or about that skill from our fingertips, literally, at this point. Um, So knowledge has become so much more democratized and so much more accessible to so many more people, uh, making knowledge acquisition and skill acquisition much uh, easier for so many more people that I think that more adults are going to kind of question how they were educated and certainly in looking at their own children might say, you know, maybe there is a better way to learn that's more uh, in line with just how we as adults learn, how humans are kind of created to learn, um, that really does focus on tapping into these natural drives for discovery, exploration, and invention. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. So so I want to talk about your, your own uh, venture into schooling and education as a parent. Where, you know, how did you approach that decision um, did you did you always set out like with the mindset to do things the way you're doing them now? Um, has it been a you know a, a process that's evolved? How, how how did you you know walk me through that process? Right. Well, as I said earlier, you know I'd always been interested in alternative education and different K to twelve learning models. So that had always been in the back of my mind, even um, as a parent. But I think for, for both my husband and, and I, when we were looking at education options for our children, we have four children, when, when my oldest was um, a toddler or preschool age, um, we realized that, you know, sending, we live in the city in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just next to Boston, and we realized that if we sent um, our children to school, their learning and their world would contract. Mm -hmm. So they would spend their days in the same location with the same age segregated group of peers, the same static handful of teachers doing the same standardized curriculum. And instead, we really wanted them to be immersed in our urban community and the people, places, and things of, of our environment. And fortunately, here in the city, we have so many incredible homeschooling resources, museums, libraries, maker spaces, different shopkeepers and organizations that offer homeschool classes during the day, mentorship opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, and those sorts of things that we just realized that would be a much more expansive education for our children than sitting in a classroom all day following a standard curriculum. So that was what ultimately, you know, made us decide to homeschool. And then I think my pathway toward unschooling, which, you know, I sort of define as self-directed education, uh, similar to the podcast name here, um, where where we're sort of distinguishing school at home homeschooling from um, a a focus on self-directed education, really instilling this kind of personal agency in individuals and allowing them to sort of set their own path while being facilitated by adults uh, in their communities. Um, That occurred because I was, you know, certainly hooked on homeschooling with with my children when they were young. But um, as my older daughter began to near kindergarten age, I thought, oh, oh, now, you know, now I have to get serious about a curriculum and really yeah. start thinking about replicating school at home. Uh, and so I started, you know, researching all these different curricula and, you know, made sure that they were going to be engaging and fun, but they were also going to have these kind of rigorous expectations around reading, writing, and arithmetic. And as I was kind of narrowing down my curriculum choices, um, out of nowhere, she taught herself how to read. Mm-hmm. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting because here I'm about to spend all this money on a curriculum, a kindergarten curriculum to teach my child what she's already doing. And that really made me step back and realize how much else she was learning and doing. Again, being facilitated by uh, us as her parents, but also by, you know, various classes in the community and other family members and peers and so on. And that just made me really pause and say, you know, maybe we don't have to, maybe we don't, maybe at Education doesn't have to be something that someone does to someone else. Maybe we can simply facilitate the learning that they're naturally doing. Yeah, that's that's a great way to great way to think about it. I really like that. So one of the things that that when I think of of schools and the common narrative is is this um, this tendency to worry about the measurements. Like, was it successful? You know, what what were the grades? What were the standardized test scores? When you think about you know your own path as a as an unschooling parent, like gauging whether 
your children are learning or, or they're progressing or, or whatever, whatever rubric you use, you know, yeah, how, how do you approach that? Or are you, are you concerned about measuring success at all? Well, I think different um, unschooling families and unschooling organizations um, assess quality and effectiveness mm-hmm. differently. Um, but I will say that unschooling doesn't mean that young people aren't taking classes. It doesn't mean that they're not even taking tests. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not following a curriculum. I often use the example again of my older daughter now who's 13, who's um, been taking Korean language classes with a native Korean language tutor three times a week at the public library. Well, now in our homes during the pandemic, but at the library <laughs> when, uh, when before all of this three, um, for a couple of years now, and that interest really sprouted from her interest in martial arts, um, where she was, she became interested in Korean language and culture and history, um, through her passion for martial arts. And she uses a very rigorous traditional language curriculum and has frequent quizzes and tests from her tutor. And, um, but it's all in pursuit of her own goal. It's not that we said now you have to learn a foreign language or now you have to learn Korean. Uh, it's something that she's really passionate about that fits in with sort of her present and future uh, objectives. Uh, And she also knows, and I think this is a key element to the sort of unschooling and self-directed education philosophy, she knows she has the freedom to quit. So at any time that she doesn't want to do Korean anymore, she says, okay, I've had enough, two years is enough, she can move on to something else. And I think it's that freedom to exit that is so critical when we think about um, the conditions for human flourishing. Yeah, that's, that's so powerful. Um, I, th- <laughs> I think so many students are, you know, used to asking when, when will I ever need to know this? Also, there's no escape route except getting through it. So that can be, that can be frustrating. Um, when I think yeah, about, yeah. when I think about, you know, some of the, the common themes and narratives about education, um, you know, t- today in particular, more than ever, it feels like there's so much controversy swirling around homeschool lately. In your opinion, why why are why are some people so mad and host or hostile towards towards homeschooling? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Perhaps you're referring to um, <laughs> the recent Harvard Magazine article um, that highlights har- longtime Harvard Law School professor Elizabeth Bartholet, um, who recently published an 80-page paper in the Arizona Law Review calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. And I've been actively responding to that as, as have other um, homeschooling advocates and educational choice advocates. Um, you know, I think that there has always been a real, um, a real sort of battle, <laughs> so to speak, between um, those who believe that everyone should learn in the same way in this kind of dominant public school system and those who challenge that and say, no, we should have all kinds of education options. And this goes back to my earlier point around the origins of compulsory schooling to begin with in the mid 19th century that really had a lot of um, anti-immigrant sentiments associated with it. Uh, There was a enormous immigration into, for example, the city of Boston, of course, Massachusetts passing the first compulsory schooling statute in 1852. The population um, of Boston doubled between 1820 and 1840 with predominantly Irish Catholic immigrants uh, fleeing the Irish potato famine. And this really challenged the dominant Anglo-Saxon Protestant ethos at the time. And that was a real key part of kind of the origins of mass compulsory schooling or the common school movement. So we're often taught that um, or kind of internalized this belief that the public school system and common schools were this effort to kind of bring everybody together. And it was, um, you know, this wonderful way to instill democratic ideals and American ideals, when in fact it was really about Americanizing immigrants who thought differently, who had different religions and different cultural practices. And it was really an effort to uh, forcibly assimilate, in particular, Irish Catholic immigrants. Um, 
And in fact, the Irish Catholics uh, rebelled and ended up creating their own parallel system of parochial schooling uh, throughout the later 19th century um, because they refused to have their children be educated in these common schools that were um, said to be secular, but were actually very much focused on Protestant ideals and values, Protestant teachers, Protestant texts, uh, the King James version of the Bible. I mean, very much, um, very much Protestant schools, not kind of these uh, secular common schools that they were uh, alleged to be. And I just think that that, that tug of war continues between, um, you know, this kind of collectivist view that we all have to be in it together and this individual view of let everybody, you know, educate and raise their children the way they see fit. And with that, of course, the uh, lingering hypocrisy because one of the architects of the common school movement in the 19th century was a man named Horace Mann, Mann. Uh, who was instrumental in helping to pass that first compulsory schooling statute. And he homeschooled his own children with no intent of sending them to the common schools mandated of others. And I think you still see that very much today among people who would preserve the status quo and force everybody into uh, a public school system, uh, but often will choose to send their own children to expensive private schools, for example. So they may oppose school choice for others, but exercise it for themselves. Yeah, that's, that's um, I mean, I, I appreciate the history, the historical context of that, but it, it, it definitely makes sense. And it's, it's, it's always um, a little bit laughable when, when you have a bureaucrat advocating a, a particular, particular method that they have no interest in and adhering to for their own situation. <laughs> so um, in the wake of coronavirus, you know, I want to get your opinion on this too. So many people uh, across the, the nation and across the globe really have, have been forced into homeschooling for the first time and maybe not traditional homeschooling. You know, they're, they're trying to replicate traditional schooling in the home now. Um, as I think about that, like, what do you feel are some of the most important tenets to get right when it comes to homeschooling versus or, or unschooling effectively as compared to just replicating the classroom at home? Right. So, you know, right now we have over 50 million U.S. students not in school due to the COVID-19 pandemic um, learning from home to varying degrees of, of replicating school at home. So some districts have been able to really ramp up uh, virtual schooling and continue with several hours a day of the curriculum that young people were getting in school. Others have had more difficulty in that. Uh, many districts now are actually cutting their school year short, uh, just ending it all together at this point, uh, saying hopefully we'll be ramped up for fall um, with some better technology and some better uh, you know, digital curriculum options. So you see a wide variety there, but either way, you do have 50 million students now at home with their families um, learning. And although, you know, I often say this is nothing like authentic homeschooling um, because we are disconnected from our communities, um, even myself as a, as a homeschooling parent, this is quite different than anything we've ever experienced. No. Most of our time, most of my children's time, I should say, is spent outside of our home, taking classes in the community, interacting with their peers. My older children go to a self-directed learning center a couple of days a week. So this is a huge shift for all of us, just the way it is for everybody else. But I think that there are still uh, opportunities to really look at education as disconnected from schooling and to the extent that families are able to make that separation from the curriculum directives and school day expectations during this time, I think they may be pleasantly surprised to see just how incredible their children are in terms of being able to learn and and discover um, you know we have these amazing online resources that are sprouting almost daily now where many of which are free, where we're able to um, tap into content that we previously wouldn't have been able to. I mean, you have, you know, world famous authors and illustrators, for example, offering workshops or live streaming uh, training sessions. You have virtual tours of 
um, hundreds of museums around the world. You have uh, re free online learning resources like Khan Academy, which um, provides a variety of different um, content curriculum for all kinds of subjects, sort of the leader in online learning that's always been free and they're offering more resources. So there's just an amazing time to tap into many of these other uh, tools and to show parents the ways in which they can facilitate knowledge, connect their children to these resources, but not feel like they have to be the ones teaching them. I think that particularly now during the pandemic, if parents feel like they, um, they have to be the curriculum enforcer and the yeah. teacher, as well as trying to get their own work done and trying to manage life in uh, social distancing, it can get very, very, very stressful very quickly. And so to the extent that parents can just enjoy being with their children, um, you know, reading books together, watching documentaries, pointing out some of these cool resources that are sprouting online, uh, I think they'll find the whole experience to be really rewarding. And I'll just add that um, again, even though this is nothing like typical homeschooling, I think it's fascinating that EdChoice just came out with a survey recently where they interviewed several hundred families about their experiences during the pandemic and found that more than half of these families, have, these parents have a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, to that, I would say, gee, if you think this is, a, is tolerable, <laughs> yeah. then just imagine the real thing uh, when this is over. And I really do think we'll see an uptick, uh, not only in the number of homeschooling families, but people looking for alternatives to school yeah. more broadly, certainly virtual schooling and other types of schooling alternatives. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fascinating statistic, and that's just asking the parents, let alone asking the kids what their opinions are of of not sitting in in classrooms. So, uh, as you you brought up a good point about this this um, you know the, the already you know pretty pretty large advent of technology in in the education space, but I think there's been an overwhelming response. Um, from, from people trying to respond to people now being at home, trying to supply more resources or, or make access, um, make resources more accessible to people at home. There's all these cool innovations happening across, you know, all dimensions of education. As you think about all these changes happening, you know, what excites you most about the future of education? I think that we are poised for a dramatic education education transformation. Um, you know, I've been talking a lot about the similarities between this uh, pandemic and what happened with uh, New Orleans and the school district there in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, Terry Moe out of Stanford University wrote a book last year called The Politics of Institutional Reform in which he um, really traces the impact of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2005 um, to dramatically reshaping the school system in New Orleans to become an almost all charter school system. Uh, and really, he really says that this couldn't have happened had it not been for the disruption caused by this event that really loosened a lot of the bureaucratic and institutional structures that prevented innovation and change. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of that, too. I think parents are looking for different options, maybe more versatile options. There's evidence uh, in, in a, a new research paper out of the Brookings Institution, for example, finds that uh, many workers will continue with teleworking even after the pandemic ends, that there's really going to be this shift in the ways we work to be much more flexible. And I think if parents realize that they don't have to be um, off at a building five days a week during their work, uh, then maybe they'll want to give that same freedom and flexibility to their children. And I think that there will be all of these new models that will sprout or that will be expanded upon, uh, led by education entrepreneurs to really open up more possibilities for families in terms of learning. Yeah, that is such an exciting future to think about. There's so many cool things happening, and I, I appreciate your point of view as well. I, I, I seriously hope, and I think I, I tend to agree when I look out at the world, but I seriously hope you know we're on the cusp of something massive, and, and we all remember the things we're learning right now once, once the, you know, the shutdown ends and the, the pandemic disappears. So 
I want to ask you something a little bit different, um, a little bit different uh, than, than asking you more about education. You've built an awesome brand around education and unschooling and school choice and, you know, become a very prolific content creator on this, 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 um, you know, this particular niche. What's, what's your, what's your advice for, you know, a young person out there who's interested in, you know, in becoming a thought leader or expert in their own area interest? Where do they start? How do they know they're ready to start creating content? You know, what would you say to that young person? Well, this is really interesting, I think, particularly um, related to Praxis's mission and um, helping young people recognize, you know, alternatives and different pathways into finding your passion. Um, and I think so. I think this is relevant. You know, several years ago, I was considering um, doing a doctorate program, kind of going, I have my master's from Harvard in education policy and thought, oh, maybe I should get my doctorate in education and sit in classes for another few years <laughs> and write a dissertation and learn all about, you know, quantitative methods of of uh, academic research and all of that. And I was seriously, you know, considering going through that path and then just felt like, you know, this is just going to delay what I really want to be doing. And that is really researching and writing about education, particularly education innovation. And so I just started writing. And this was oh, probably at least five years ago now. I uh, wrote an article and submitted it to Forbes back when Forbes was accepting kind of general submissions. They don't do that so much now, but they used to just to, and, and allow you to just submit. And other platforms now do, so there'd be other comparable uh, media platforms for anybody listening at this point. But back then they were. And I, so I wrote an article about alternative education and learning without schooling and all of that, and they published it. And I thought, oh, this is great. Let me try that again. And so then I did another article and another article. Um, and looking, and then I wrote a book, and then I, you know, was working for Fee and Cato. It all really came from doing, instead of just sort of waiting, um, waiting it out, or you know, sort of sitting passively in a classroom for a few years to to collect another few letters to my name. Uh, rather than postponing that, I just said, let's just do it. Let you know, the opportunity cost of sitting in this classroom is high. I want to just be um, doing now what is meaningful to me and what I think I can make a difference in rather than waiting until I get some kind of credential and then doing it. Uh, and that was really powerful. And when I look back on that, I'm, I'm just, um, you know, I think it was the right choice and, and the right path to go down. Um, and, you know, certainly got there quicker than I may have if I had been in a classroom for another few years. Yeah, that's such an awesome, awesome way to think about it and approach it. I, I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you sharing that. That's cool to hear. It's cool to hear you had such quick success on it, too. Like that quick success, probably, you know, the, the dopamine you get from that being published in Forbes, like, of course you want to keep writing. So that's awesome. Right. That's true, too. And, and that's a really good point. I mean, I think... It, I was lucky. I'm curious, right? If I hadn't had that early success, you know, what might I have said? Oh, okay, now I should go. <laughs> I should go to school. Um, but I think I think it is just this idea of favoring action yeah. um, over waiting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like what you said about you know this is a detour. I want to write. Why? Why not? Why not start now? Um, it's a great way to think about it, Carrie. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been a pleasure uh, speaking with you. Uh, for, for all the listeners out there, you can follow uh, Carrie on Twitter at Carrie underscore EDU. Be sure to check out her, her, her book, Unschooled. Are there any other exciting pieces of content you'd like me to share? Um, no, your listeners can find me at fee.org slash Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y. There you have links to all of my articles at fee.org, links to my Cato site, to Forbes, and all my social media networks. Uh, and you can go ahead and send me an email. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for joining us today on Self-Directed. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Mitchell. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah.